You're listening to Toronto's number one real estate podcast, powered by Watson Estates. The most successful local real estate investing starts right here, right now. Here's your host, broker, investor, and social media influencer, Bradley Watson. Good morning, investors. Bradley here from Watson Estates. It is Monday, June 22nd, 2020. It is a beautiful day and a wonderful day to talk about Toronto real estate. My favorite topic and the same topic that put us number one on iTunes, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. And if you're just tuning in for the first time, welcome. What are we doing here? We are checking the latest news as it relates to our marketplace, talking to investors, great investors, amazing people across the city of Toronto who are all trying to do the same thing. Figure out, is this a market worth investing and where can I find opportunities nowadays amid COVID? If you think that when something like this happens, there's no opportunities, you are sadly mistaken and unfortunately you could be missing out. So I'm so excited to be talking about what has been happening. And today we have some really useful dialogues happening even outside of your classical realtor slash Treb. We have outside perspectives on everything going on as we continue to try and formulate our own framework of thought before putting that money out to purchase your local properties. So here we go. We're going to start off talking about this question. Do investors expect a market crash? or boom amid the pandemic. And we're not coming from any real estate angle here. In fact, we're coming from the perspective of investors. It's gonna be great. And then I wanna re-ask the question, if you missed our podcast on Saturday, please, 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 uh, my voice cracked. <coughs> please, please, <laughs> go back and listen to that podcast. And we covered a little bit about this, but one of the biggest articles today continues to be this question of listings flooding our market, according to the Canadian Real Estate Association. So is this something we need to be freaked out about? And I want to talk about those stats today. And then how is Canada's economy on the global stage? Are we, are we noteworthy or are we just kind of, you know, not important as it relates to the Security Council? <laughs> Where do we fit in all of this? Are we a leader or a follower? Are we getting dragged behind? Or are we at the forefront of what will be an amazing recovery on the tail end of COVID-19? We're gonna talk about all of these things, but I, I'm just gonna quickly highlight, these are the types of articles, by the way, that I just resent. They're the stuff that is like, I don't wanna know, but yet I feel like I'd be doing a disservice to not mention it because it is literally the top article. Like, why is this more important than everything else going on? I don't know, but it's big news. The CEO of property.ca, a Toronto based real estate listings website has stepped down from the position after making a series of controversial Facebook comments from his personal account. Not even real estate professionals are safe. Cancel culture is alive and well, but yet when I, I didn't read all these articles, I didn't even want to read the comments that he had said. I, so I, I'm not in a position to comment on this, but in this article, they say, how do you judge someone based on snippets? It's insulting. There was a, this is from a black, they say, they literally say Lewis, because this qualifies him, a black sales representative with the company. And so he's saying it's insulting to me on every level. So he's standing up for them. They're all standing behind this guy from their brokerage, it sounds like. And he says, racism and sexism do not live within our company and definitely not in Carl's world. So whether this guy is guilty or not, I don't know. This is crazy. And this is why I'd rather not weigh in on such a heavy topic that's completely outside of our world. Except for Aunt Jemima, because I'm going to miss Aunt Jemima, let's face it. And I know you will too, if you're a real Canadian. <laughs> but as usual, I need to stay in my lane. And the closest thing we got to lanes here in Toronto is laneway housing. Did you just assume my housing type? <laughs> uh, okay, all right, let's jump into this, guys. We're having some fun. I hope you guys are too. Pull up some popcorn. I guess it depends on what time. This is your drive-in movie for the day. Do investors expect a market crash or boom amid the pandemic? I. It's funny because when you read the URL, it throws you right off. It's. I believe it's the Motley Fool, but it's fool.ca. <laughs> so we're we're starting our morning off listening to a fool, <laughs> or should I say you're starting your morning off listening to a fool? <laughs> Here's the article, it's called, Will Canadian Housing Market Crash or Boom Amid the Pandemic? 
What's beautiful about this is this is written from the perspective of people investing not in real estate, but in shares, like actual investors in the market. We're talking TSX, New York Stock Exchange. So it's a very interesting perspective. They're analyzing, this person is, and obviously this is an opinion piece, no doubt. It's an opinion piece. And I want what I want to point out here is there's going to be conflicting views, even you can see it even within what he's saying. So check this out. The Canadian housing market is sending confusing signals to investors after quite a strong start earlier this year. Those who are predicting a crash due to the pandemic-driven economic shock are surprised to see that housing prices are still rising. Wait, what? Inventory levels, on the other hand, have shrunk massively as sellers have gone into a wait-and-see mode. We're going to ask a little question about that in a second, so don't listen to this fool on that topic. After going into a deep freeze, Canada's largest housing market, Toronto, Toronto, so... I, I came to realize yesterday, sometimes I do this, the unforgivable sin, which is I call this place Toronto. I do it a lot, <laughs> which has some people, I think, wondering, is he even from Canada? <laughs> Toronto, Toronto, Toronto. Anyways, I, I don't know if that's a joke, but I say Toronto. I actually sometimes throw in the T, TTs showed some signs of life in May, where sales registered a 53.2% rebound from April. This revival in housing activity combined with the low mortgage rates has revived hopes that Canada will avoid a housing market crash in this recession. One of the points that I got out here that was kind of cool is, you know, back in our past podcast, if you've been tuning in for at least even a couple weeks, I'm sure you would have heard this. We talked about this idea of the Great Recession of 2008. There was this boom that happened shortly after. We had this crash, and then we had this boom, and then we had a second crash, which obviously they've conveniently left out of this part. But they said here, for some buyers who remember a real estate boom that started soon after the Great Recession of 2008, this might turn out to be a great time to get into the market. In my opinion, the conditions on the ground aren't favorable to create another housing boom that we saw in the past decade. So he's saying, this individual is saying, that that boom you saw that took off, which we've kind of seen locally, but let's not tell him that, that that boom that we saw isn't going to happen like we saw in 2008. And again, whether that was an amazing thing or not, if you were day trading real estate, it was a great thing. But realistically, the price came back down and ended up back at ground zero and continued on its merry way. And we have seen steady prices. In fact, you're going to see an argument in a, in a minute from one of our listeners pretty much saying the same point that I'm saying. We haven't seen a correction since 2000, like a legitimate price correction. And 2008 isn't was not a legitimate price correction. It happened so quick and it rebounded so quick and continued on its merry little way. In the late May survey commissioned by the credit monitoring company TransUnion, I believe they're number two after Equifax, if I had to, if I had to place my bets, two-thirds of people said they were concerned about their ability to pay their current bills and loans. So why does this guy... So he says, why won't the housing market... But my, if I reword that, why does this dude, why does this fool <laughs> say we won't have a, mar- a housing market crash? I strongly feel... I love how it's like... Why won't we have, I feel, we're going on feelings here. This is, the, actually the comedy of the whole thing is that that is what investing is, is going on feelings. That Canada isn't slipping into a situation where the housing market will crash. The equation of the Canadian housing market is quite simple. There is more demand than what the market can supply. When you have a country's population increasing at a large number of wealthy immigrants, making Canada their home, it's hard to imagine a scenario where the market will collapse. I think he's shortchanging the impact we've had on immigration. That's my thinking on this. We have seen some pretty severe numbers on permanent residence applications being hit in huge numbers. Outstanding number drops. But then he goes and talks about RBC analyst Robert Hoagie. Hoague? Hoague. H-O-G-U-E. Hoague. <laughs> Hoague said... <laughs> Home prices could stay stable in the near term as both buyers and new listings pull back, but he expects the composite benchmark price to fall 2.9% in the second half of the year. So again, this this common theme exists. Wherever you come from, market's going to do great. Market's going to do garbage. Keep clean words. Clean words. They're all very kind of the second half of 2020 is your question mark. 
then I guess it's a matter of how fast do we recover from there. The trends, however, could reverse next year as low rates, strengthening job market, a bounce back in immigration helped surge more than 40% in 2021, and price dynamics also returned to favoring sellers. So this guy's very optimistic. Now, before we kind of run away from what this guy's saying and you kind of pull your eyes out thinking, well, who is this guy? It's an interesting perspective because this the reason I chose this article, not just like any booba on the street that has a forecast, is because of his ultimate explanation for what you should be doing okay oftentimes the articles we read are biased they're all in fact this one is too but they're biased in favor of either a market crash or market market collapse i guess those are the same thing (laughs) either of those two things (laughs) but this guy is actually taking a completely different approach which is why i i add some credibility to like i i want to know what other people are saying too so his final solution to this article is this. Many U.S. hedge funds have built a short position on CIBC. They believe that the lender, which has the biggest uninsured portfolio of mortgages among the top Canadian banks, will suffer huge losses and borrowers will fail to pay their mortgages. For the aforementioned reasons, the stock market of CIBC has plunged 13%. And he goes on to say, well, this is a great, attractive buying opportunity for investors in CIBC. So his ultimate solution is, is buy bank stocks, specifically in CIBC, because so many people think they're going to collapse and they're actually overstating the incident of mortgage deferral ish- crises or crises, 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 right? So this is a, a very unique perspective because if you were to just read between the lines on what this guy's saying, he is saying that we have way overstated an issue with mortgage deferrals. The banks have the money set aside. People are hedging against our banking institutions, which is already a risky move in itself because let's face it, this is Canada. We never fail. And it's not like the States. It's not like the banking system in the States by any means. The bottom line, I don't think the Canadian housing market is going to crash. I'm in the camp of those forecasters who believe Canada has a robust housing market, increasing demand, rising population, blah, 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 blah. There you have it. Counter perspectives. And recently we've seen other articles talking about people saying, yeah, even if you have mortgage deferral issues, we saw this actually yesterday on Saturday, go back and listen to that podcast if you missed it. But we have other people saying, the, speaking specific to Toronto, the market is doing so good that not even a failure for people to pay mortgages is going to stop it. Believe that or not, that's your call. Like, do you think that's the case or not? But I, I think that it's commonly understood that that is one of the big three challenges right now. In fact, I would say the other two are the potential of a second wave and unemployment slash immigration. Between those three, with the, with the mortgage deferrals, between those three things, that that is what's going to summarize the second half of 2020. Serbs no longer an issue because we've just realized that the money never ends. Money never ends. Okay, let's move on to topic number two, numero deux. The biggest news coming out of the weekend other than the fact that the CEO stepped down, is this question of the big banks. Whether or not we have a looming crisis across Canada on the number of new listings way outpacing the number of sales. Why this is important is we kind of debunked this on Saturday, but I'm going to do it again here. Because this article is so big, we can't just graze over it. It's important that we bring some clarity. Let me give you a little bit of a story. The Canadian Real Estate Association recently published their stats for May. This is problem number one. They announced this is what's happening across Canada. And as many of you know, what happens across Canada isn't necessarily what happens in Canada's greatest city. So that's Toronto. I like to refer to Toronto as Canada's greatest city. That's just a force of habit. So the banks then stepped in and Better Dwelling does a great job of highlighting what happens here because they, they're going to use it. Why not use? Use a concern. Let's get readership. This is great. Beautiful. Here we go. Better Dwelling, four of Canada's big banks note real estate inventory is rising faster than sales. The article reads, Canadian banks have been divided on where the market will head, but they're all seeing the same thing. Inventory rising faster than sales. Four of the big six commented on May sales across Canada. All four banks stated that rise in sales last month sounded more impressive than it was. The bigger common, th- so in other words, the number of sales activity you have, not even that big a deal. They all agree, which we then will see in a minute, that's not the case, but 
for the purpose of this article, we all agree the sales, it's not even that impressive. Yeah, because a 60% rebound in sales is not that impressive. The bigger common concern appeared to be inventory increasing faster than sales. Oh, that's the big news. Well, apparently it is the big news because this is the biggest article. So RBC, what do they have to say? New listings and sales had fallen at roughly the same pace in March and April, but listings increased faster in May. They expect this trend to continue adding, quote, we believe downward price pressure will build in most markets in the coming months. Okay, so in standard SA fashion, your first one is your biggest doom and gloom, and your last one is your next biggest doom and gloom. And then you got a couple trickle down the middle that don't really agree with your point, but like you got to fill in your word count. So Bebo, they said it's easy to put gaudy percentage increases coming out of what effectively is a shutdown in, in April. New listings jumped even faster than sales. They add it's still too early to judge the ultimate impact on prices, but entertain it's possible. <laughs> it's a very different tune than RBC that they are flat instead of falling, right? So they're saying it's flat. So this case that everyone just thinks it's falling. Well, BMO doesn't think that in your own article, Scotiabank. They're, they're tuning. So the numbers, by the way, sales were down 42% and listings were down 36%. So you can see that discrepancy, I guess at 6%. And when I first heard that, I was a little freaked out too. I'm thinking we got to track this. I remember saying that on our podcast, we have to keep an eye on this. This is kind of weird. Like we're seeing a disconnect. We're seeing like, there's a, there's a, a, a spread happening now that could pose a problem, but they warned that there's three things you got to watch out for the virus. You're hearing it a second time here. Mortgage arrears coming up, the deferrals, and population growth, notably a decline in immigration. And then TD, they say sales only retraced about a third of activity lost between February and April, and sales remained at multi-year lows. They expect buyer expectations can still coast and squeeze out gains for at least another few months. However, they expect the market will cool into the later part of the year and into 2021. Are you guys seeing the pattern? I'm seeing a pattern. Like you saw it in the good guy, right? The good guy, the fool, fool.com. The fools are saying, fools being the ones that think the market's going to go up. The fools are saying the second half of 2020 is going to, you're going to have a bit of a problem. 2021, we're going to have to recover. The, the geniuses, the banks, right? The ones that we trust for this article, the ones that are calling for a market crash now, that that's the point we're standing on here. They're saying that the second half of 2020 is going to be rough and into 2021. So I guess it's for how far into 2021, but by 2021, we got to recover. So can you guys recognize what I'm seeing here is we've got a common message. We're unified in our message. This is great, right? And again, a sign of stability. And we're going to see a stability translating into key decisions potentially being made by the Bank of Canada in a minute. Very interesting stuff. But to bring some peace to this question of the number of new listings, as we talked about on our podcast Saturday, Zucasa did further studies. They did not leave us hanging. You folks rock. And they recognize there is a straight up balance in the sales to new listings here in Toronto. Don't get freaked out. The sales to new listings ratio is actually almost identical to what it was in May of last year. In other words, Korea, they fudged up. Because they they pretty much said, oh, you all fall, we're all falling apart here. And I don't know if they meant to do that. They were just reporting. But unless you have more specifics on our city, to just get freaked out and create huge articles that sell for everyone and scaring the whole population. Guys, I just added this in, this article, this point. This was not mentioned at all in that last article. Now you guys have a full picture. Time will tell. Can we just do this? Can we Can we meet in the middle here? Can we just say that let's wait until June's numbers and let's see what's happening in Toronto. In to oh, there we go. I skipped the T on that one. <laughs> I am Canadian. Honey, where's my beer? <laughs> we have a nice balance here, guys. That's what the numbers are saying, not what the Canadian Real Estate Association. I know I'm a member of the Canadian Real Estate Association. I love them. They publish the data that I use. They're, they're the ones running realtor.ca and I, I'm on their team. But... We need to look this market by market. Okay, let's listen to some of you guys because what I'm saying, although it's going to come from my mouth, is getting a little repetitive here. So let's let's talk what you guys are saying about what the market is doing. Brandy Heyman, thank you for your YouTube comment. Someone I know just bid out eight other bidders. I am so confused. Who are these people buying right now? Who are these people buying right now? Like who is paying? And actually the comment I left on there is, you know what that means? There are seven bidders that lost that'll be there next time. <laughs> 
We are seeing bidding wars. In fact, Kai, thank you for your comment. Bidding wars back as per Condo Wong. Who are these people bidding? I've been actually trying to get a hold of Condo Wong because I think that would be a good podcast interview. If you have any relationship with him directly, tell him to call me back, man. I think it'd be a good interview, especially as it relates to international investment. He's he is he runs a pretty tight ship over there. I think it'd be good content. Anyways, we then have other sides, right? So Riza, thank you, Riza, for your comment. Since they opened the door to purchase Canadian real estate to investors abroad, and even a foreign student can purchase a house in Canada while studying, houses have quadrupled since the 2000s. We are we were kings back then, buying a house for 180. If I buy a house for a million and a half now, I am just a mortgage prisoner. All I say, property prices has to be checked just like the weeds in our backyards. So we have, we, we can, you can hear the frustration, right? In all of these comments, bidding wars, like when people are like bidding wars, they're not saying bidding wars, woohoo, like, yay, bidding wars. There are people that stand on that position. I'm kind of, sometimes I'm like that. <clears throat> sometimes you're kind of like, oh, this is great. This, I mean, if you have a property and your neighbors got bidded up, that's, that's great news. But I think more than not, this is frustration. Right? There's a lot of frustration here. People don't like the idea that how are we getting bidding wars? Like we have huge unemployment, lack of immigration. Who is buying right now? And the price is already too expensive. People are deferring their mortgages. Like we have an incredible amount of national debt. We have an incredible amount of personal debt, consumer debt. Who's buying? People are buying. Maybe you're asking the wrong question. <laughs> Not who is buying. But who is not buying? <laughs> uh, in other words, it's gonna go. It's gonna get more. Eight bidders. That's that's baby food. Just you wait. Just you wait. Okay, let's talk about Canada's economy on the global stage, guys. I don't have a. I don't have a bias. <laughs> so what? How is Canada on the global stage? I saw an article that came out of Bloomberg, and they talk about IMF. Into the International Monetary Fund, I believe is the IMF. Yes, it is. It, it, inter, International Monetary Fund. And they pretty much are analyzing global economic forecasts. They're looking at all countries, and this article does just that. Now, we don't care about all countries, but I do think it's important that we know what's happening across the world and across as far as it relates to the economy. Officials at the Washington-based fund have warned that a revised outlook due on Wednesday this week may feature a more pessimistic view than in April. Back then, they said that the, quote, great lockdown caused by the coronavirus would force a global contraction of 3% this year. So they're saying in this article, it's going to be more. Two months after its dire predictions of the steepest decline, they're saying now it's going to be even more. A gloomier forecast might reflect their assessment of the severity of damage caused by the widespread shutdown and activity. The UK economy, for example, instantly shrank by a fifth in April alone. Now, according to Bloomberg's economist, Tom Orlick, <laughs> oh, there's got to be a joke in there somewhere. Orlick. I'm going to get this forecast. Orlick. Uh, anyways. <laughs> rapid, his, he said this, rapid fire forecast updates reflect the shifting trajectory of the virus. Some countries, including China and Germany, have successfully bent the curve. Others have not. Add up that messy reality, and despite green shoots of recovery in May and June, the outlook continues to deteriorate. So globally, we have a problem, according to the IMF. Who is compiling the forecast noted last week, the, this economist, Gitta, Gitta Gopinath. <laughs> uh, these names. The first time both have suffered in tandem. This is an interesting point, though. This was actually highlighted in my notes. We see there is actually a downturn what seems to be forming in both advanced and emerging market economies. So this is what they said. This is the first time both have suffered in tandem since the Great Depression of the 1930s. Usually we see one or the other, advanced or emerging, but everybody's economy is getting hit. Get it? Get it. Globally, we have, we have ourselves some challenges here. So what about Canada? Where do we stand in, in this global talk? And they didn't actually reference Canada in that article either. I just wanted to look at it from an uh, international. We have we are very open, at least not right, not right now, but before. We are a very open country. We depend on each other. It's important to see. So we look big. Let's move in a little bit, okay? Let's move in towards Canada. According to theglobeandmail.com, as Bank of Canada quells talk of sub-zero rates, next move may be a hike in 2022. Interest rate hike? What? 
Let's listen to the article. Investors looking past the COVID-19 pandemic are betting that the Bank of Canada could be among the first major central banks to hike interest rates, signaling new Governor Tiff McClellan's success so far convincing the market not to expect negative rates. What? Interest rate hike? No. Money market data shows investors have moved away from pricing and additional easing by the Bank of Canada. Instead, see a steady profile for rates this year and next, with about a 50% chance of a rate hike in 2022. What? No. Come on. Place your bets. Black or red. Wait, can I say that? We're talking casino, guys. We're talking casino. I don't want to lose my license. Make sure, I'm, make sure I'm here again tomorrow morning. The U.S. Federal Reserve, which has been pressured by President Donald Trump to cut rates below zero, is not expected by money markets to hike until at least 2023. So the U.S., in other words, they suck. <laughs> they suck. We rock. This is my main note I wanted to point out here. The Bank of Canada has done a better job than some other central banks of quashing speculation around further rate cuts. Many people across the world are thinking, we need more rate cuts, more rate cuts, more rate cuts, right? And our costs right now are really high. Our servicing costs are really high, uh, like relative to what they could be, because if we brought it down, it'd be lower. But Justin Trudeau thinks it's already, well, they are record lows. So I guess that's true. If you think that the economy did hit bottom in April, that a rate hike in two years is a plausible outcome, I think. This is, this is the chief Canada strategist of TD Securities. So... Don't take off the potential of a rate increase as like, this is never going to happen because they're saying that Canada would be the first of central banks to do it. Now, can you pull it off? I don't know. Do you think, I, I mean, if you ask Trudeau right now, if we're going to see an increase in 2022, can we revisit that question on whether we're going to be able to support that debt? I think he's going to dodge that question because you don't want that. We don't want an increase. And when we look historically, anytime we've seen an increase in the recent past, it's come with another decrease. It doesn't, it's very difficult to go up. But the good news, the silver lining in all of this is that we have hit the pause button on bringing our rates down. Let's not keep doing that. Let's not keep doing that. We've, if we, if we have met the, we have met with a good response, let's leave the response where it's at. All right, let's move right along. Interesting stuff. So Bank of Canada, our banking sector is outperforming the world, if we were to summarize that. Okay, so we're doing better than the world. So how about Toronto? Toronto. <laughs> I'm going to keep catching myself on that now from now on. I've just messed my life up. CP24, Ford, this is coming out this morning, expected to announce today if Toronto, there it is again, can move on to stage two of the reopening plan. Guys, we're going to hear something today from Doug Ford. And I think based on what the mayor thinks, not just my own thoughts, but based on what I'm hearing, the buzz, you're going to see a reopening happening potentially this week. That would mean hair salons, restaurant patios, barbershops reopening across this beautiful city. Mayor John Tory said he's optimistic the city will be given the green light this week. I think it's going to happen this week. That's my own prediction and is not based on an inside secret. I just think the numbers have headed strong in the right direction. It's true. We've seen over two weeks of declines consistently now for two weeks. And so I think everybody now is going to be in agreement at this time. And they're expected to speak today at Queens Park for one o'clock alongside a health minister and finance minister and the labor minister. That is Mr. Doug Ford. So looking at it from a global perspective, all the way down to our great and mighty city of Toronto, whether the Raptors can play this season is up in the air, but I am still rooting for our city. Now, don't go offending anybody. And if we're lucky, I'll see you guys at the same time and place tomorrow morning so we can learn and analyze more as it relates to the Toronto real estate market. We are number one on iTunes, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Because you know what? I think it's because we love Toronto real estate. And I think you do too. If you haven't, give us a sub. Give us a high five. Send us a, an e-hug, whatever you can do nowadays on the Twitters. And I will see you in the morning. Take care and keep it real. <laughs>